Do you have a habit that you'd like to break and find it increasingly difficult to do so? Very often, we make a resolution that we're going to stop doing something, whether it's overeating, whether it's biting our nails, whether it's other habits. And we really have strong resolve and will. And we're even ashamed of that habit. And we set out on our way, all determined, and yet, after a little while, we gravitate back. Which perhaps the very nature of what a habit is. Something like wired in. So why is it so difficult to break habits? And what can we do about it? And at the same time, how do we build good habits? This affects us all because we are people of routine and we have many different aspects of our lives that are actually good habits. And yet, when something becomes difficult to break, it can really drain us and demoralize us. So please join me in this discussion. How to break bad habits and build good ones. Hi, this is Simon Jacobson, and we will be speaking about how to break bad habits and build good ones. This program is dedicated by Nancy Hernandez in honor of Norman C. Fung, a fierce lover of Israel and all the Jewish people. Who hasn't faced this dilemma of a habit that just won't go away? As much as we'd like to get rid of it, it just continues to nag us. These can be habits from things like biting your nails to overeating to different addictions that we get stuck on. Some are, can be more destructive than others. So what is it about a habit that makes it so difficult to break? Is there anything positive about it? Now, obviously, there are good habits that we'd like to incorporate in our lives. So we want to address... Firstly, the power of habit, why it's so difficult to break, and then methods, once you understand why it's so difficult, we can then develop methods of how to break bad habits and to develop and build good ones. A number of years ago, there was a best-selling book by Charles Duhigg called The Power of Habit. And he, 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 posed, he posited the argument for why it's so difficult to break a habit based on a very simple principle called efficiency. Our brains are brilliant. And just like we have today algorithms, or was once called macros, the brain also creates such shortcuts. When it sees that you do something repeatedly again and again, the brain determines why you expend so much energy each time. It just builds in a type of automatic trigger you wake up in the morning, you wash your face, take a shower, you brush your teeth. It all becomes automatic to the point sometimes you ask yourself, did I do it? The brain is basically reserving its energy for more strenuous tasks that need more concentration. So in a way, it's like doing shortcuts. And we all have that. As I said, macros, algorithms, programs, that when you press A, Automatically, it triggers a whole process, a whole assembly line, so to speak. And that is the reason why it's so difficult to break. Because once the brain wires in, hard wires in, that this is becoming a routine, whether for good or for bad, not so simple to just tell the brain, hey, we want to stop it. It's both simple and quite fascinating. But it tells us a lot about life. The truth is, I'm sure it's not his innovation, the very concept does exist in texts, including biblical texts and mystical texts, 
The idea of something, once it's repeated many times, becomes, like the expression goes, the way your neurons are fired, that's how they get wired. Now this can be for the good. A person thinks positively. Positive psychology. Positivism. Has that element. You think positive, your mind becomes wired that way. But it could also work against us where negative thinking also becomes part of our wiring. Now, mind you, this is not necessarily nature per se, that you're born with it, but nurture can become nature. As I said, when you do something enough times, it becomes part of your system, part of your wiring, part of your very programming. So it has its great qualities, but also can work against us. And that's why it becomes so difficult, among other factors. Now, why is it important to understand this, this power, this force? Because then you understand why, how difficult it is to break and never underestimate. You know, many times we think, you know, what's the big thing? I just won't do certain things. I'll refrain. I'll exercise discipline, restraint. But you see how difficult it is to maintain that. Because again, the status quo is much more powerful than we think. Its power lies in the fact that it's not so loud. You know, it's one thing when someone shows you that they're your, they're, they're your ad, ad, ad adversary and they challenge you. But it's much harder to deal with something that doesn't sound so loud, but it's still built in. It's like it gets frozen in place. And whatever you do, you just can't get rid of it like a bad wart. So understanding the very nature of how it works can help us actually transform and change bad habits. But let's delve a little bit more into the concept of habits. You all know the concept of a comfort zone. You know what comfort zones are. By definition, a comfort zone is a comfortable place to be in. And who wants to get out of your comfort zone? It's um, disconcerting and disorienting and demoralizing when our comfort zones and our security blankets are stripped from us. Disruption. Disruption is very grating and very difficult for us. We like our routines. We like pr our predictable situations. Uncertainty is uncertain. Uncertainty, yes, disorients and shakes us up. Certainty, you know what's coming. So on one hand... That sounds like a good thing to have a comfort zone. But show me an area of growth and I'll show you that there's no comfort zone there. Wherever there's true growth, there's going to be some form of disruption. Something will shift. That's what defines growth. Because if you have more of the past, then you'll have more of the same. What do they say? Insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. If nothing changes, nothing changes, they say in the healing world. A phrase I like to use is, if you think what you thought, and you say what you said, and you do what you did, you know what you're going to have? What you had. It's a mathematical certainty. Because that's the nature of cause and effect, action, reaction, that everything is a continuation of what you put in there. So if you are in a comfortable place and you stay there, you're going to have more of the same. It's the disruptions that shake us up and that, in a way, pull us out, force us out of a certain situation. You're suddenly challenged, a difficulty you didn't expect. Now you have to become innovative, creative, resourceful. You have to find deeper resilience, new, new solutions. Every invention in history was a result of some form of discomfort, some form of problem, some battle, some, some resistance, some challenge. In the words of the Talmud, an olive does not produce oil until you press it. Press it, pressure, deadlines. So the thing we like least is the thing that produces most. And the greater the growth, the greater the disruption that precedes it. Using the words of the mystics, of the Kabbalists, Hasidic 
in the Hasidic le- lexicon, dictionary, there's the concept of yesh, ayin yesh. Yesh is a state of being. Ayin is a void, a vacuum, where that state of being is disrupted to the point where you're like not, no longer in that place, like something has been dislodged. So there's a certain suspension, you can say, and that leads to a yes, to a greater state of being. A caterpillar goes into the cocoon, the chrysalis, comes out a butterfly. The birth pains during birth produces the birth of a new child. The egg cracks and a chick appears. A seed deteriorates, rots in the ground, and then sprouts a sapling. Creativity is a child of frustration. You take a piece of gold or other metal or other substance and you melt it down, then you can reshape it into a beautiful ornament. You need to shed one layer of skin to assume another. I think I've given enough examples. Nowhere in life will you find birth or growth without that disruptive state. The point is not the disruption. The point is to move to a new paradigm. And the shift to a new paradigm means you have to some way get out of the previous one. Now bring it, let's bring this back to the, the discussion of habits. Habits is exactly the opposite. Habit is locked in, frozen in, wired in, as we said, hardwired. The breaking of a habit is very much part of an dis- uncomfortable phase and one paradigm moves into another paradigm. As a matter of fact, when we talk about the very birth, the very existence of each one of us, the mystics explain that the soul goes through a very difficult stage before it comes into this world, before birth. The soul doesn't want to enter this world. Who would want to enter a world when you're living in a spiritual oasis? Completely comfortable. No health issues, no financial issues, no corruption, no bullying, no abuse, no hurt. No pain, no loss, no death. And you give a look at this world and you say, a world filled with darkness, with hostility, with duplicity. Yes, we may get used to it, but it's a world filled with challenges. Why would a soul want to leave such a beautiful habitat, a spiritual environment, to come into a difficult place, a battlefield called life? And yet, the soul is ripped away and commanded, you need to come to this world. Because it's in this world that you will achieve true accomplishments. Because in your comfort zone, you enjoy, it may be comfortable for you. You'll be basking in the glow of spiritual energy and true spiritual light. But your real power will never emerge. You need resistance. You need challenge. And that's when you become great. So that our very existence is the paradox of getting out of a spiritual comfort zone, entering into a material difficult life with a goal of becoming even greater because like the olive that's pressed produces the best oil so life is this this dance if you wish of the two poles two two extremes on one hand getting out of a comfort zone and the other hand growing in extraordinary ways So part of the process is to get out of habits. And the interesting thing is not just out of bad habits, but also good habits. If something becomes too habitual, it's too routine, yes, that's a nice thing to have a good habit, but it means you're also not growing. And growth is dependent on pushing yourself and always surpassing yesterday's accomplishments. So the very concept of shift, of change, of paradigm shift, is the concept of a journey, of movement. A movement, by definition, is going to have that element of breaking away from a previous state into a new state. So a few things that sum up what we've we've said so far. Number one is, why it's so difficult to break a habit? Because it becomes wired into us. For efficiency purposes. Number two, the very essence of life is breaking a habit. It's breaking routines getting out of your comfort zone. You'll see people who have achieved excellence, it's not just excellence compared to others. They themselves will go beyond the mo- their own being. It's a fascinating Talmudic story of Rab Zera, a great sage. 
And he mastered what was called the Babylonian Talmud, the Babylonian study. There was a Babylonian Talmud and a Jerusalemite Talmud. Two Talmuds, many parallels, but very different. And then the Talmud tells us that he fasted 40 or 100 fasts in order to forget what he had studied in the Babylonian Talmud so he could be able to learn now a new way of study called the Jerusalem method. So the obvious question is, since when do you have to forget a body of knowledge to acquire new knowledge? Knowledge is accumulative. You want to go further? Go further. But you build upon previous knowledge. And the answer is both simple and fascinating. He didn't want to forget the knowledge, the facts, the data, the method. The Babylonian method was a method using argument and counter-argument, questions, probing, challenges. It's a particular method. The Jerusalem method is far more like a straight line, a straight light. Let's get straight to the point. So the methodology is what he wanted to change. Most of us psychologists say today, by the time you're age 7, age 9, 10, have already developed our way of thinking that we've picked up from our parents, from educators, from society. We're not talking about all the knowledge. Obviously not at 9 or 10 years old, fully knowledgeable or fully mature. But a pattern. You've already developed a certain way of thinking, for good or for bad again. What Rabbi Zera's achievement was that even at that age, I think he was 40 or whatever, mature age, to go and change his methodology, not to learn new facts, a new school of thought, a new philosophy, a new way of think of, of new ideology, a methodology different. That's why he needed to fast. He needed to get out of his comfort zone. These are people in pursuit of truth, pursuit of growth, will always want to push themselves further. So the breaking of a habit in that sense is actually part of the very part and parcel of what the purpose of existence is. And yet, as I said, it becomes increasingly difficult because it does get wired in. But if you know that that's the purpose, then in a way you can say that's the purpose of life. It's like when a person runs a marathon. Of course it's difficult. And you know up, up front that it's going to be difficult. And it's painful. But you want to push yourself because you want to surpass where you want to go beyond what you've achieved yesterday. So it really is about actualizing yourself in the fullest possible way. So now let's talk about, so then what do you do? What do you do to break habits? So first, the first thing we need to understand is since that we have become wired this way, it's going to be difficult. But you have to understand there's another part of us that's not wired. And this t- takes us a little deeper into the human psyche. The way the Hasidic masters and the Kabbalists explain it is that the, our very being, our very psyche, and the truth is every part of existence has two components to it. They're the structures, the very defined structures that follow rules consistently. And then there's a part of us that's beyond structure. Maybe a good way to explain it would be with, uh, in science. We know that that what dominated for many centuries or for a while was Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics is very predictable science, predictable meaning that everything is cause and effect. The classic billiard ball effect, which is what? That if you strike a billiard ball at the same angle, with the same pressure, the same, all the factors are the same, and you strike one ball into another, the result will always be the same. If this result is different, it means there was something that was the action was different. That's why the reaction is different. You throw an object up in the air, same circumstances, it will always fall in the same fashion. But then, in the 20th century, with the discovery of quantum mechanics, suddenly a world was discovered in the microscopic level that was not predictable, was indeterministic in contrast to Newtonian determinism state of probability, where you can have a situation where two observers will see some, a different result. Is, is light a wave or a particle? The famous Schrodinger's cat's analogy, is, is the cat alive or dead? And there are theories of exactly how it works, but one thing has been established, that there's a state, of, there's a state on the microscopic level, not on the macroscopic, that it's not about a lack of data, 
that even if you have all the data, there's something indeterministic. Something that's not defined by the regular structures. Now this is counterintuitive and actually irrational in a way. What do you mean? Water is water, fire is fire. What do you mean? How can it be a wave and a particle? And how can it be dependent on the observer? So many theories that try to explain it, but it's been proven time and again. And we don't have a reconciliation why in the macroscopic world it's deterministic and in the microscopic it's indeterministic. But when you study the mystical side, you understand it very well because the divine energy has both elements. The essence of divine reality is beyond structure and beyond, beyond, stru- beyond non-structure. Neither it's not de- meaning it's not deterministic and it's not non-deterministic. But there are two tracks that emerge. One is a determined, these are the rules, the laws of nature. And then there's a dimension that is not subject to those laws. And both of them exist within us. Laplace was a f- French philosopher scientist who said at the end of the 19th century, give me all the data in the world and I'll be able to predict what a person will do or whatever the situation is till the end of time. The only reason I can't predict is because we don't have all the data. There was a big uproar in the church. What about free will? But then when quantum mechanics entered the picture, suddenly one second, there's a whole dimension that's nothing to do with data. Even with all the data in the world, you can't, certain things are not predictable which tells us that we have within us these two dimensions. So that means you have a part of you that is not driven by habit. There's a part of you that absolutely is. And as I said earlier, the mind is wired that, is geared that way to be efficient to create structures like that. And a big part of our life is defined by structure. But you are not limited to that. There's a part of you in your soul that defies and goes beyond structure. That's why you can choose. Like if I were to predict, I'd say, listen, every human being needs to eat and drink. That's true. And if you don't eat and drink for enough time, a person could unfortunately become ill and and die. And yet I cannot predict, well, maybe you're fasting today. So naturally it would be a person would eat and get thirsty or hungry throughout the day and they'll usually eat. But you can impose upon yourself the will not to eat. I understand it's not indefinite. At some point you'll have to drink or eat if you're going to survive. But the point is, that we're not wired like an animal. There's no question that animals in the wild, when they're hungry, you can't tell them today is a fast day. Today we're taking off. When they have to hunt, they have to hunt. They're pre-wired and it's clockwork. And it's necessary to be that way. Just like you know the sun is going to rise exactly the right moment tomorrow morning. Or wherever you are in the world, you may already be daylight. So there are things that are absolutely predictable. But then there's a component we call that X factor that remains beyond structure. So in a way, you want to break a habit, you want to access that dimension. Because as long as you're a creature of habit and you go to that world, you're only going to get the same habitual results. So how do we access a place like that? That brings us to getting out of our comfort zone. The concept of doing something that beyond the norm, beyond the natural. No, they say, to err is human, to forgive is divine. When someone hurts your feelings. So the natural reaction is you'll reciprocate. You're definitely not going to forgive that easily. But a person forgives, you know what you're doing? You're going out of the pattern, the predictable pattern. And that opens up the doors of the indeterministic that allows you to break a habit. I remember among many stories, but one, one that jumps out at me. I was counseling someone who was coming to my classes. He was married. I know, I'd known them. I was at their wedding, and I knew them for many years. They, had, they loved each other deeply, but there was a lot of dysfunctionality as well. She had grown up in a very dysfunctional home and did not trust. He, for business purposes, had to travel. Every time he would travel, she would have a trigger. It would trigger something, the insecurities of her childhood. And literally, at times, she would abuse her husband by calling and saying, I know you're abandoning me. I know you're having an affair. And he would try to calm her down and say, I went for work. You can track what I'm doing. But it wouldn't help because it was an emotional trigger. She just brought her back to her childhood insecurities. And at times like that, sometimes she was very vicious. Later, she would apologize. But at the time, once I get a call from him, he was traveling. He said, my wife just 
literally what she said to me, I don't think I can never go back to her. It's just, I can't respect her anymore. And when I said to her, we know that she has challenges from her childhood. I said, yeah, but I'm not her caretaker. I'm her husband. I have to be her equal. I'm not her doctor. I'm not her therapist. The thing she said to me, I'm her husband. I need, I need. And it was hard. And he, he literally was thinking of, this is it. It's over. I can't continue like this. Now, we were close. And I knew I could say things to him that maybe others couldn't. So I said to him, listen, I want to make a suggestion which you're not going to like. What is it? I said, call up the, t- the city where your wife is lives, where you live. Go- call up the closest flower shop and order her what kind of flowers does she love? Roses, whatever it may be. Order a, a dozen roses. He says, are you kidding me? I send it to her with a nice note. He says, are you kidding me? At this point, roses? I want to divorce her. I hate her for what she's saying to me. So I said, break your natural inclination. And I explained to him this concept. You want to open up new opportunities, you have to do something different. Think different. I'll share another story in a moment. But And he, when he was fighting and kicking and screaming, and then I said, please do me a favor. And not with any conditions. Anyway, to his credit, he did it. You can imagine how shocked she was. And that was my intention. I wanted to shock her too. Because it was the exact opposite of what she would expect. She would expect reciprocity. That's what you, how you speak to me? I don't want to talk to you. And feed into the toxic energy and actually fulfill her self-defeating prophecy of him abandoning her. He did that. She didn't react. It wasn't like he came home and she said, oh, thank you. But over the months, she acknowledged it. I knew what it would do. It's the shock treatment. That was not the purpose. The purpose was to get beyond the normal expectations. It's a tremendous tool, if you think about it, for, of growth. I remember I was once having a conversation with someone close to me. He was having his difficulties. So we took a walk, I remember, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Anyway, we're walking. And he's asking me what I think. Suddenly we walk by and I look up. There's a bar. The bar says Jake's Dilemma. This guy was named Jake. It says Jake's Dilemma. You see a guy with all the hairy, you know, like a tangled hair. You can see he's struggling. I mean, you know, an image, a cartoon image on this, in this bar. I say, hey, maybe we got to go in here. Maybe it's a sign. No, we're not going in. I said, but it's interesting. Maybe there's signs coming. Let's keep our eyes open. We walk two more blocks. There's a big, big billboard. You know, painted, one of the painted ads on a wall of a building. A picture of John Lennon. Apple was running an ad called Think Different. Think Different. And I said, maybe that sign is telling us about this sign. You want change, you have to think different. Speak different. Act different. And then differences happen. It will not happen automatically because you just want it. That's the power of breaking a habit. So if you think of it that way, I'm not saying it's going to be easier necessarily. But when you think of it that your brain has wired that, but now your job is to introduce some new energy. So instead of trying to attack the habit and say, I'm not going to do this, it's going to be very difficult to do that. Introduce something new into your life. Some new energy. Not even connected to that habit. Because habits breed habits and change breeds change. So when you change something, it's like shaking something up, that shake-up will affect the rest of you. You know, sometimes, you know, when something is stuck, you just try to shake it up. You're trying to loosen it. The same thing here. So start a new habit. You have some bad habits you want to break? Start something new. Every day, as we talk about the spiritual spa, dedicate a few minutes. Spa is an acronym, study, prayer, action, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral conditioning. Every day, Start studying something new, a new idea, a new spiritual passage or book. In the world of prayer and emotion and emotional, a song, a new song, a prayer, a meditation. And in the behavioral, start start something new, an extra act of kindness, a little extra charity, extra volunteerism, sending out a few more texts that day of sharing a kind or virtuous expression and sentiment to others. These changes... In your life, create change. Change breeds change. 
So it's not attacking the habit, it's introducing some new energy. It's like bringing fresh air into a toxic room. So it's one thing trying to get suck out the toxic air. Another is bring fresh air, and automatically it starts diluting and changing things. A little light, a little light dispels darkness. So when you think of it that way, firstly, it's a method of creating change. Secondly, it also, it also addresses the very purpose of our existence, to get out of our comfort zones, to do things that we're not comfortable with, and through that, achieving great growth. And sometimes overlooking our natural reaction would be one way. And we say, you know what? I'm not going to react as I was expected. I'm not going to be a creature of habit. I'm going to allow myself to transcend my habit or my natural reaction to that action. These things is what creates magic. Lightning. That's what it does. It brings a whole new perspective. It's similar to the idea that when you're trying to solve a problem, and you've struggled with it back and forth, and then you come and consult a new person, and they listen to it, a fresh set of eyes, and they'll suddenly say something no one thought of. They're bringing fresh air. It's like a new perspective that shakes it up. And sometimes that's exactly what you need because you can get so used to the problem and all the solutions that you come to a point, we've tried everything, but you haven't tried everything. There's always something else that you may need, another set of eyes, another person, another perspective. You need to climb to another level of the mountain, a higher level, and you see broader and wider horizons. And so many other examples that capture this idea. So my friends, to break bad habits and to build good ones requires effort, no question about it. And it requires more effort than when the habit was built in the first place because now it's wired in. You need a stronger force to dislodge it, to undo it. But don't be perturbed. Don't, you don't have to do it all one night in cold turkey overnight. It's a step-by-step process. It's introducing new things into your life which automatically weaken the hold of other things. And if you're persistent and you continuously pursue in a relentless way, but not necessarily giant steps, even baby steps, you will see progress. You will make progress. These are some suggestions in this important topic about bad habits and good habits. Now, also being accountable to someone. We have someone you can report to and you can discuss and review helps tremendously because it avoids the trap of subjectivity where you convince yourself to over-exaggerate what is going on. Important to be sober, to almost be brutal and be able to look at things in the eye and know what exactly is happening, what's the progress. Obviously, some with compassion, not just to beat yourself up or let someone else beat you up, no. But with a certain firmness and honesty and integrity. And all that adds up to introducing the new paradigms that help us get out of the old paradigm, whether it's a bad habit or a good one for that matter and discover new dimensions, new horizons, to help us spread our wings and become and actualize what we're really capable of becoming. More than just the finite, but in the words of Blake, that when the doors of perception are cleansed, we, man will see everything as it is, infinite. That infinite potential that lies often trapped, trapped, like in captivity, within the structures of our lives, to release that indeterministic, energy that lies trapped in the determinism of our structures. This has been Simon Jacobson. MeaningfulLife.com is our website where you can find this and many, many programs. Please take advantage. Check it out. Subscribe to our offerings, including our YouTube channel, and please share. And of course, feedback, thoughts, comments, suggestions. And let us continue this journey of bridging these two worlds of the indeterminate, deterministic, and the deterministic, the extraordinary and the ordinary, beyond structure, within structure, and let structure actually help us transcend structure. Everyone be well and be blessed. Thank you so much. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.